Hello, thanks for joining me. I decided I would like to share in this session um, one of my favorite passages. Like I was thinking, yeah, what are some of my favorite passages? I love the whole Bible cover to cover from Genesis to Revelation. However, there are certain ones that just are packed rich. I'd rather have these passages than money itself or possessions. Uh, they're so rich to the soul and they're great, great, great promises. Like Peter said, exceeding and precious, exceeding precious and great promises or something like that. So I decided to pick a few and I, I thought, which ones are they? And I just have to pick this one right now. Um, there's others like Psalm 103. I hope to say that, you know, maybe in another video and all Psalm 103. <laughs> Somewhere in that middle section. Oh, it's so delicious. It's so good. This is powerful. This is from Micah. Small little book um, here that's after Amos and uh, Jonah, Amos, and then it goes Micah. Seven chapters, and it's at the very end. Micah's a prophet in the 700, 722, whatever, and he's preaching to Judah which is a lower part, and is, he's in, from a city that's kind of southwest uh, in that area. And uh, Micah is talking to them. He does a lot of threats and rebukes God's using him as a prophet, a messenger of God, speaking his messages uh, to them. But I really want to go zero in on the last part. And I think it's okay. I don't think we should just take the Bible and just do whatever we want with it. It's God's words. And he directed it through that prophet to the people of Israel. Nevertheless... In the New Testament over here, it's very clear that not only are those passages like examples for us, the Gentiles, the Jews, when Paul said they're examples to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking to Gentiles in that, in that uh, city, plus Jews, they're a mixed people, but he said they're examples to us. Wait, I thought it was a Jewish, you know, he, he spoke to the Jews. The fact is he also said in 2 Corinthians, he said that all the promises of God are yes and amen for those that are in Christ. So if you're in Christ, you know, the promises of God, and I know people might take this and go, oh my goodness, how can you say that? Um, but it's true. This book is for the whole world. It's really for his people in the world, but it's Gentile and Jew. Anyway, just want to set this record straight here that these passages could be for us too all the verses. Um, there are certain verses that are actually particular and very specific for that time period and for those people. But the majority of them are for us too if you're in Christ. And by the way, this passage right here, if you go into the New Testament and you go throughout the whole Bible, they all say various things, uh, the same thing. It, they mean the same thing. But listen to this passage. I could ramble too much. Let's get into it. This is what he, he says. Micah says at the very end, and by the way, throughout he sprinkles it with judgment and also restoration and promises that I'm going to do this. And, you know, it's not just all punishment. Here is a, it comes to the peak. It's just so powerful. He said, who is a God like unto you? We could just stop there and talk about that for a while. Who is a God like God? Well, no, there are no other gods. But, you know, in that age and that time and those nations and all there's all these nations following other gods so he says this is the most high this is the god who's like under you not not of these other local um you know deities from other nations he says who is like who is a god like to you like you who pardons iniquity <laughs> i mean i'll never get tired of the sweetness the nectar the juices in the richness of that that god pardons iniquity get that he pardons i don't care what type of sin however deep your sin is god's mercy goes deeper however far you've gone astray out of his straight and narrow road in his way however corrupt or perverted you've gone on the on, on, and perverted your ways against god your path may be way out there and you might go, oh, there's no way I can be pardoned. You don't know God. Who is like unto God who pardons iniquity? I love that about God. I love the word pardon. It rolls off my lips with honey. It's sweet to my soul. And I mean that. I'm not just saying that. I feel it. It is so, so true that God's pardoned me for all my sins. Ugh, a lot of sins. <laughs> And now I'm changing more and more where the sin just keeps being ripped out of me and I'm not sinning near as enough. I mean, near uh, like I used to, not near enough. 
but I'm just, I'm just different because of God. One of the reasons I'm so different is because he pardons me so much. You just don't want to do anything against such a God. How can you offend someone that loves and pardons and forgives sin so readily, so eagerly, so passionately? This is the heart of God. When you see the heart of God, it's over. You're going to fall in love with him. You're going to want him. You're going to realize, oh my goodness, I hate sin and all that. Who is a God like unto you that pardons iniquity? And then he goes on and on about, it. he says, and passes by the transgression. <laughs> he sees a pa the transgression passes by, like, I'm going to forgive it. It's gone. Just psh, almost ignores it. He doesn't ignore it. The Bible does say in the book of Acts, he winked at the past sins, but he passes by it. And I just give this feeling like, okay, I'm going to pass by it and get to you. I want you and I'm going to go past your muck and your sinfulness and your wickedness and I want to come right to you. I pass by it right unto you. And passes by the transgression and the remnant of his heritage. So I, I think he's kind of like this, almost a feeling of Passover. You know, he just just goes over it and he it doesn't destroy us. Isn't that amazing that God hasn't destroyed us? I should have been killed long ago. The first sin that I ever did, knowing the incredible holiness and perfections of God and the excellence of his morality. I should have been killed the first day I sinned years and years ago, and I've done a multitude of sins since then. And so God passes by that and just reaches out to me. It's fantastic. And, and, and the remnant of his heritage, his heritage are his people. Remnant is a, a few of his people who really want him. And so that's one of me. Are you a remnant? Are you uh, kind of the few who really love God? I hope you're in that, that group. He retains not his anger forever. <laughs> he doesn't hold on to his anger forever. The Bible says he's slow to anger. <laughs> he's so patient. Behold the long suffering of God. But listen to what he says. He doesn't retain it. He doesn't hold on to his anger. He doesn't hold grudges. He wants to, he, he flares up after a while of sin and he gets angry. God's been angry with me before, but in his firmness of voice to me, he wasn't furious with me. I don't think he's ever been furious. I might be wrong, but he has been upset with me over my sins. He's a caring father. Of course he loves me and he, of course he wants the best for me. So it upsets him just like a parent gets angry. So he retains not his anger forever. He doesn't hold on to it forever. <laughs> it's great, good stuff. And then it says, why? Because, get this, he delights in mercy. He delights in it. He loves mercy. He wants to be merciful. So he wants to go there quick. <laughs> so he gets out of his anger and he delights in mercy. Those three words, delight in mercy. That's just so moving to me. What a sweetheart of a God. Like he delights in it. He rejoices. He celebrates. He likes it. He likes being merciful. He doesn't like to be judging. He does. He's a righteous judge. He's got to judge. It's, he's got to destroy sin it's in his universe and evil and all. But he delights in mercy. Isn't this good? <laughs> one, it's like stacked. This is good. And then he lays on another one. And then he lays on another one. I mean, just, it just like a kaleidoscope, it gets better and better. Like in each color or each layer is like sweet and, and good. He goes on, <laughs> he keeps on. You just got to see the layers of the, of the love of God, the depth of the mercies and the grace of God. Just see him, see who he is. He will turn again. He's in judgment mode in this book. He's, this is a hope that we have in, in him. He will turn again, you know, turn towards us instead of rejecting us. He doesn't want to reject us. He wants to accept us. He loves us. He will have compassion on upon us. There it is again. There's another line. He will have compassion. He will have compassion. He will have compassion on us. <laughs> He's a compassionate, soft-hearted, tender-hearted, sweet God. He will subdue our iniquities. I like that when he subdues it. He grabs our iniquities by the throat. <laughs> he doesn't grab me by the throat like I deserve. He goes, okay, I'm going to grab that sin. I'm going to rip it out of Gordon. <laughs> it's good stuff. It says he will subdue our iniquities. He'll grab them and then and conquer them. And, that, and then it says you will cast all our sins, all their sins, 
into the depths of the sea. He's going to go, he's going to throw it. Now, how, how far can God throw with his strength? <laughs> he will throw it into the depths, deep parts of the sea. Okay, I'm going to take the sins out of you. I'm going to throw them away. And I'm not just going to throw it so you can see it again. It's going down the depths to the bottom of the sea. Isn't that good? That's why I love this passage. I go to it. Go to it often. Let me read it all together one more time. Just listen, please listen. Who is like, sorry, who is a God like unto you that pardons iniquity, that passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He doesn't retain his anger. He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Amen and amen.